think we are going live and yeah, we are live now. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our 63rd webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. On this 3rd of June, 2024, I'm really delighted that you have come to join us. And uh, my name is Sabina Heinz. I'm the person responsible for our webinar series together with Adriano Tino. And uh, I'm one of the vice presidents of SRI and also responsible for our art chapter. Our today's special guest is Professor Thais Rosumano. Hello and welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. And <laughs> yeah, we are really glad that you are here to join us. And uh, Professor Russomano will talk about effects of microgravity on human health. Uh, I also would like to welcome Adrian Ortino. Uh, he is one of our vice presidents and former president of Space Renaissance International and one of the founders of SRI. Hello, Adrian. Thank you very much, Sabine. Very welcome to Thais Sumano and uh, Sabine. And uh, yeah, I'm very curious to uh, attend this uh, uh, lecture by Professor Sumano. So yeah, uh, by the way, yeah, I, I can say that uh, I was at ISDC in Los Angeles, ISDC 2024, one week ago. It was a very, very interesting conference. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we had the opportunity to to make presentation in uh, about the space 18 SDG, our proposal to add an 18 SDG to the 2030 agenda, and uh, uh, also uh, I participated. I have participated to a, a panel on the moon, on the incoming cis uh, um, lunar economy, uh, and. Uh, the start of the Artemis uh, program and everything. And of course, in this uh, new scenario uh, where a space settlement is going to uh, to kick off uh, in, in, in these years, of course, uh, 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 protection from uh, uh, microgravity and from the radi uh, cosmic radiation be uh, are getting more importance. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the research should should be uh, uh, there should be more priority to this kind of research and uh, and finally <laughs> I hope that we will start experimenting with simulated gravity and uh, yeah I have seen a presentation of a company that is planning to make a, a the first rotating uh, uh, station orbital station and that would be very very important thing uh, okay so i don't want to, to thank you <laughs> yeah let us hear first uh, the lecture but before i give you the floor professor rosomano i would like to introduce you to our audience uh, professor thais rosomano uh, has uh, more than 30 years of uh, experience in aerospace medicine space physiology telemedicine and di digital health She's an MD from Brazil, specialized in inter internal medicine, has a uh, Master of Science in Aerospace Medicine from the United States, and a PhD in Space Physiology from, or Physiology from King's College in London, in UK. She worked for three years as a researcher at DLR in Germany and before establishing and coordinating the Microgravity Center, uh, PUCRS Brazil for 18 years. Um, she is academically linked to several universities worldwide as an elected academician of the International Academy of of aviation and space medicine and the International Academy of Astronautics. Uh, here she belongs to the Board of Trustees. Professor Thais Russomano is a board member of companies or its uh, patents related to space sciences, has numerous scientific publications and has acted as a voluntary mentor for Space for Women. Uh, initiative of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. 
She participated in ESA Parabola-like campaigns in 2000, 2000 and 2006, is a member of ESA topical teams and participates in NASA-funded projects. In 2021, uh, through Innova Space and in partnership with a pharmaceutical company, uh, she participated in research at the ISS um, with a Japanese Kibo model. Um, Thais also worked as an educator, researcher, and cons consultant in projects of ESA, NASA, DLR, PT Space, AEB Brazil, uh, Innovative, uh, Innovate uh, UK, Blue Abyss, Opma Cities uh, UK, International Space University, Pro Opportunity Dades, um, El Salvador. Uh, Professor Thais Rosumano is co founder and CEO of uh, Innova Space, that's from the UK, a company dedicated to the education research and innovation of human space exploration, uh, aviation, medicine, and digital health applied to extreme environments. Yeah, interesting biography. Um, Professor Rosomano, the stage is yours. And while you are sharing the screen, I would also like uh, to welcome our audience. We have people watching from all over the world, uh, from the Netherlands, from the United States, and um, yeah, other countries. Okay, thank so, you very much you for the invitation and um, also for the introduction. Of course, um, space um, physiology or the effects of microgravity on human body and mind uh, is a vast topic. You know, it's uh, I've been involved with that for over thirty years and. Um, uh, as much as I study <laughs> and I, as much as I research and teach, uh, the conclusion ends that we still don't know a lot. <laughs> so I, I understand that most of the, uh, the audience is not uh, doctors and the doc even the ones that are doctors or from the health area uh, are not space doctors, let's say. Uh, so I, I, will try, I will try to... Uh, I prepared, in fact, a lecture that is very motivational in the sense, you know, we can uh, discuss after my presentation different topics and aspects. Uh, so I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to talk about details of uh, things related to the body, the, the, the different body systems, because I think that's going to be uh, boring <laughs> and it's not the, the goal of this uh, presentation. The goal is really to give a good overview and uh, motivate discussion. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And this is the purpose of this webinar, because we want to build a bridge between uh, art and science and all interested people. Okay, you must start your Okay, lecture. so, yeah. Uh, when I was invited by Adriano, he asked me about the effects of microgravity. Of course, nowadays we are also uh, concerned about the effects of uh, hypogravity, which is, um, uh, um, let's say, a gravitational field that is not as intense as we have here on Earth, like we have on the Moon and on Mars but uh, cause, of course, change in our anatomy and in our physiology. But I will concentrate in the microgravity, as I was asked to do, and we can then, maybe in the discussion, try to uh, understand a bit more about hypogravity, you know, the moon, um, the return to the moon. So, uh, first, let me just... Do something here. Okay. Uh, first, you need to understand that we are Earth beings, you know. And when I say that, it is um, it is very important <laughs> because we are shaped by the characteristics of our planet. It is not just gravity; is the the content of oxygen, is the presence of water is the protection from space radiation, at least at some degree, with uh, our uh, atmosphere and with our magnetosphere. We have, a, we, we are shaped by 
by uh, our planet. And even inside our planet, you know, we have uh, uh, different groups of humans, let's say, living in uh, more extreme environments that uh, assume a different physiology and even a different anatomy. So people that are, for example, living in igloos in the Arctic, or someone that is living in, in deserts in uh, in uh, Sudan in, in in Africa, so we we also have uh, variations in based on changing the temperature or the altitude or, or um, you know uh, the, the way that the communities establish in in more remote or extreme environments. Uh, this is important also to understand because uh, when we talk about going to space, we are basically adding to that history another extreme or, 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 or remote uh, environment. Uh, space is hostile for us, uh, as it is for most of us, for example, to go today to take a plane and go to the Arctic and live there, for example, for a month. Uh, and it is hostile because uh, although the spacecraft nowadays, they mimic our planet in many aspects that are very important, such as the content of oxygen in the air, uh, the barometric pressure that is uh, equal to sea level or one ATM. Uh, we have a control, control of temperature, for example. Uh, we don't have a good control of uh, CO2 still, uh, because we cannot ventilate properly the, the, for example, the International Space Station, but we can manage and we can try to understand the effects that this elevation of uh, uh, CO2, which is a toxic gas for us, for humans, uh, can have in a during space uh, mission. But the key, the two key points would be microgravity and uh, uh, the exposure to radiation, although, as I said, we, had, we have two layers of protection. We lose one when we, go, uh, uh, when we go to orbit, but we still have the magnetosphere that protects us. It will not happen, or I mean, we are gonna be much more exposed to radiation when you go to the moon, uh, return to the moon one day, or we go to uh, Mars no, to, to live and work over there. Uh, so microgravity, and this is also very important for you to understand, is uh, we say ah, the astronauts are in microgravity. In fact, they are in a kind of free fall. No? They, are, they are falling without falling. <laughs> and, but the effects are the same as the ones that you would find in a point in the universe that you have pure microgravity. So we are gonna treat it as microgravity, although I just want you to know that at a, an altitude of a, about 400 kilometers, uh, a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour, they are in a free fall. And this is uh, uh, the effects of microgravity are the same as if they were in a uh, pure, let's say, or, or, or real microgravity in space. So as I said, we were like say shaped by, by gravity, you know, over millions and millions of years. So here we have our, um, our friend from the past, you know, uh, the uh, uh, Australopithecus, and uh, you have some, uh, let's say, different evolution moments, and then we get to our Homo sapiens sapiens which is basically us. Uh, I think that we are now going to a kind of homo sapiens spatium, which means that we are gonna become a different human being. And this will happen to our mind, it will happen to our uh, anatomy, you know, the, the shape of our body, the way that our, our body function, our physiology, uh, and it is going to be a changing uh, a profound change. Uh, I'm talking about a cell level, you know, and uh, and also the way that we interact socially and uh, and so on. So it is going to we are going to become a different species. And I think that um, Adriano said something very important. 
he mentioned about uh, the construction of a kind of spacecraft that rotates and then creates um, gravity. So let's say that it creates the gravity of Earth 1G. Now we say 1G, uh, to um, which is equal to 9.81 meters per square second. So we have this acceleration, but we call 1G just to make it easier. And if you look at these pictures here, you now you can see the um, uh, the hotel in space <laughs> with a couple looking at, uh, uh, at through the window, you know, the, the, the earth through the window, and they seem to be in a gravitational environment. And that's the first question that I want you to think about. Do we want to become a space being and then maybe even we cannot one day come back to Earth as we reproduce and live and work in a completely different environment, and then the Earth will become a very hostile place. Or we want to be as we are, the Homo sapiens sapiens, but in space, living and working and reproducing and so on in space. Uh, is it a very philosophical question? And I, but I think that's a very important one. Of course, there will be maybe a mix of uh, uh, different solutions or different companies and governments that will take one side or the other side. And, uh, but it is important in terms of, for, for my area, for space medicine, it's important to understand if we want to be a space being, or if we want to be what we are, our Earth being, in living in space with the same type of conditions. Remember that I mentioned that nowadays, <clears throat> thanks to our very smart space engineers, we have a, a very similar, let's say, environment uh, in a spacecraft or any space station that you have here on Earth at sea level. Uh, so... We were able to create that to accommodate several aspects related to uh, the health of the astronauts when exposed to to uh, to, to, uh, to space to, in a space mission to the hostile environment of space. So think about that because if we become um, Homo sapiens passion, for example, we are gonna have a possibly <laughs> a very different body different uh, shape we uh, we when we reproduce in space you are gonna uh, be let's say developing different beings that maybe one day cannot come to earth and uh, visit our planet because let's say gravity here is too much for them and they would uh, feel very uncomfortable or even it will be very difficult to uh, be uh, to keep their health in a in, in our uh, planet, even if it is sea level, I'm not talk talking about the Arctic or the deserts in Africa, or I'm just talking about uh, a normal environment as we usually experience. And of course, you know, the same is true for the, um, the bases or the habitats that one day we are gonna create on the moon and on Mars. And it will, of course, uh, affect, it, it will affect uh, humans in many different ways, emotionally, socially, um, professionally. Uh, I'm, not, I'm taking this as examples because it's not just the health itself. No, it's not just how my body is functioning or my mind is functioning. It's very inter and multidisciplinary area. Uh, to create a habitat, we are going to need uh, space architects, engineers, and uh, space uh, designers, and uh, um, you know, many people, and of course, people from the health area, but not just medicine, could be nursing, could be psychology, could be pharmacy, and so on, working together to provide a place for humans to possibly live and work. So what uh, what is important, you know, the, I, I, I pick up some aspects, let's say, of the space physiology that is very present 
It is uh, basically well known. You know, not all body systems are uh, exhaustive, uh, exhaustively uh, uh, studied. So the ones that I'm going to talk about, it is for you to have an idea of exactly what I am introducing to you, for you to think in terms of human beings in space. This is a very old chart. <laughs> I think that's one of the first that I've seen in my life when I was much younger. <laughs> but I think that's very important because it shows that um, uh, different body systems re react, let's say, to microgravity in a, in a different time scale. Some adapt very quickly, some don't adapt. And um, so I just take you here the neurovestibular system which is a huge problem is the yellow line. It, uh, as soon as you are in microgravity, we start become disoriented. Uh, there is a conflict of information between your eyes and, your, and the system inside of your ear that says if you are, uh, let's say, upside down or, or turning to right or left. And this uh, uh, conflict uh, make, uh, makes the brain sick. And one of the most common effect is, um, is nausea and vomiting. It is extremely common in that uh, in parabolic flights because you uh, in the parabolic flights. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but the airplane goes up and down, the, des describing a parabola. And during this parabola, there is a moment of microgravity. Uh, it's an acute exposure to microgravity. And that's why it's called the vomit comet, <laughs> because we uh, people really get sick there. But let's take uh, two other uh, uh, systems here. The cardiovascular system, the, the red line, you can see that it takes longer to respond somehow than the neurovestibular system. Although it responds, it responds fast, but maybe not that fast somehow because it, it is more complex and then it uh, tends to adapt. Uh, this adaptation is uh, nowadays very, uh, very, very much questioned because we could see more recently that uh, there are changes in pressures in the brain or, or in the way that the blood flows in our veins that are affected by microgravity later on on a mission. Uh, that is, it means that there was no adaptation or full adaptation at least. Uh, I'll explain a bit, a bit more. Uh, if you take the the red, the uh, dark blue line and the light blue line, you can see bone and muscle, and you can see that it's continuous as radiation, which is the dotted um, black line. So it's something that it is always there, it's present. And we need to find ways to try to compensate for that. As for any other system, no, the, anything that causes signs, symptoms, or changes that even if you don't notice because uh, it doesn't get to the point to, to cause symptoms, you, uh, it's important to understand and try to counteract, uh, you know, to co create a countermeasure. Uh, in terms of the cardiovascular system, the cardiopulmonary system, my PhD here in London was in the uh, it was in lung function in microgravity simulation. So the lungs are very important to me. But uh, in general terms, no, we have here four uh, four men. Uh, the first one is on Earth. No? So you have more blood in the. Uh, lower part of your body and then you go to the second one that you have more blood shifting to your the upper part of your body and this causes numerous changes in the size of the heart in the uh, pressures uh, we, we have uh, pressure in the eye pressure in the brain arterial pressure venous pressure all that is, uh, is somehow affected and then there is this uh, arrow this uh, long arrow which means a moment or, or, or a time for the adaptation. And then we there is a kind of adaptation, even though, as I mentioned, we know nowadays that there are uh, changes that um, are very important and uh, 
uh, they, they don't seem to be adapting <laughs> uh, in, in general terms there are many aspects that for the cardiovascular system that adapts to stay in space for a year for example and uh, but when you come back to earth that's the last uh, 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 man that is standing uh, you can see that the blood shifts back to to the lower limbs or, or the lower part of the body. The heart's a bit smaller, and then you 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 enter another phase of the space flight in terms of cardiovascular uh, health. That is the orthostatic intolerance. <laughs> Doctors love uh, different um, complex words. Orthostatic means stand up. Now, uh, intolerance is intolerance. So you have an intolerance to stand up. You feel dizzy, you, your blood pressure uh, uh, goes down, and you can faint. So this is something that very commonly happens to astronauts after space flight. If you look at these, uh, the pictures of the astronauts, the ones on the left is before the flight, and the ones on the right is during the flight. And uh, it's called the puffy face and bird leg syndrome. Because the, as you could see in the, let's say the 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 man number two there, you have more blood in your face, you no, know, in your neck face, and then it becomes puffy, and you have less in your legs, which becomes more like thinner, uh, which is kind of a bird legs. It's sometimes they call chicken legs as well. One aspect that is very important and. Uh, it is uh, very well studied because it can cause uh, discomfort to the astronauts, is the posture in microgravity. And this would also affect the way that you design, for example, a uh, habitat in space, even for space tourism. You know? uh, how can we, um, uh, let's say, accommodate this change that we have in the body posture in space? Uh, if you look at the First picture, uh, we can see that space zero G is um, the, the the person is floating, arms uh, forward and the legs upwards. It is more or less what's called the semi fetal position. Uh, that it, if you look at the astronaut in the pink uh, uh, shirt, we can see that it is uh, uh, that's. The position that's the normal position that you assume in microgravity. Uh, as I, I was mentioned during my introduction, I participated in two parabolic flights of the uh, European Space Agency, and believe me, that's the tendency that we have is to assume this position. Of course, uh, gravity is very important to define our height. Uh, here I put that it is up to six to eight centimeters that you can increase in terms of height, but it's in general is less than that, four or five centimeters. This is important even for the design of the EVA suits or other aspects related to the uh, to the working place, for example, of the astronauts. No? And if you look at the the way that the spine is, uh, you know, the shape. Uh, on the left we have. Uh, uh, the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and the pelvis, and you have this is on Earth, and then you can see microgravity is basically a completely different shape, and this can cause lots of back pain, especially at the uh, uh, lumbar level. In terms of, uh, uh, no more or less keeping that idea of posture and the. Uh, uh, muscle and the bone system, you can see that from the pelvis down, we have a lot of a loss of uh, uh, bone mass. So if you are in space, you are going to lose bone mass. And if you are in space, you are also going to lose um, um, skeletal muscles. Uh, you can see the again, the posture again of the astronaut. You can see the the, the shape of the spine, and then from the, again, from the waist down, you have the most pronounced, let's say, uh, loss of, uh, of muscles as you have with the bones. Of course, this will depend on the duration of the exposure. If you are using countermeasures, um, there are, as everything in life, individual variation, but the countermeasures are very important because they are based on exercise. 
two and a half hours a day, six days per week, you do strength, locomotion, resistance, using different types of exercise uh, devices. Uh, one of the, in terms of to, to keep the muscles and the bones, one of the best one is the first one, advanced resistive exercise device, a red. And then you have uh, the treadmill and the cycle ergometer more for the cardiovascular system to keep you fit. Uh, very, very important to perform this exercise every day. This is a, these are countermeasures that help during the mission and when you come back to Earth. But it's not just the body you know, that is affected, the mind as well. And nowadays it is much more, let's say, considered by, by space agents and scientists, uh, scientific community, uh, space, uh, um, sorry, space psychology or space psychiatry, because people are living in isolation, are living in um, in uh, without references. Sometimes they feel very um, low, you no, know, depressed. Somehow uh, they they suffer from insomnia, and I will talk about that later on. Um, they have the crew uh, nowadays. They are. Um, it's much more, let's say, uh, diverse. So you have uh, different genders, you have different ages, you have different um, um, uh, cultural or, or religious backgrounds, and and this can affect the interaction of the crew. Now, uh, we know that uh, we are social beings, <laughs> and uh, we need um, somehow to uh, accept, you know, and to learn how to deal with different languages and so on and so forth. Radiation can be an issue. Uh, there are studies with mice showing that cognition is pretty much affected by radiation. So we can have that in humans as well. And as we have countermeasures for for the, the, let's say the body, we also have countermeasures for the mind. Now we can have a moment uh, of privacy in that cupola that is uh, the first picture. You know, that you go there to see the earth, take pictures, talk to your family members or friends, or you can take or you can play music alone with someone from the uh, the mission, or even someone that is on earth. The same with games, and you have also these moments of uh, confraternization that could be a a meal uh, uh, during the day, some point in time, or the celebration of a birthday or things, uh, any kind of important date um, that the astronauts decide to celebrate together. So this is very, very important because in the past it was not possible uh, for many different reasons because of lack of technology, because of lack of space, and maybe. We, maybe a bit of lack of understanding the importance of entertainment and socialization as a countermeasure for the mind. Uh, I like this, uh, although it's from 2012, so it's a kind of long time ago now, but it is interesting that uh, uh, these authors, you know, some from uh, NASA uh, at that time, uh, were studying um, yoga in space or mindfulness in space. Uh, we need to remember that now uh, India is going to become the fourth country to send the humans into space. It was Russia, uh, states, China, and now India. And as we as you also know, this um, yoga and uh, uh, meditation and the mindfulness and so on have uh, their roots in India. So maybe it will also become a very important countermeasure for emotional issues. And uh, we have what uh, I used to call uh, the effect of daily activities in, in the health of the astronaut. It's not like microgravity or radiation or the environment itself with you know, oxygen, water, temperature, and so on. But it is how you, you live in space. And this has a very important effect. Um, for example, when you sleep, uh, NASA asks people to sleep um, uh, eight hours a day. In general, they sleep about six. And um, 
and the not not just the quantity uh, of the, the the hours of uh, sleep is affected, but also the quality. So part of the a very important moment of our sleep that's the REM sleep uh, is um, is a bit short uh, if you compare with uh, the astronaut the same astronaut uh, here on Earth. And there are many reasons for that. Um, maybe we don't know all of them, but uh, it is a lack of privacy. It is, um, it's not that comfortable. Uh, you are floating. We have no proper uh, proprioception, which is this, um, uh, you know, this, um, uh, um, inf um, how can I say, these inputs coming from the muscles, the bones, the 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 joints saying, "Oh, you are moving. You are not moving. You are you know, turning right, turning left." You know that this is uh, basically lost in in microgravity. It's interesting that uh, I don't know if you can see the uh, the picture uh, um, at the bottom. Uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, strap on top of the, the 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 face of the astronaut, and this was one of the requirements be, that they asked. In fact, because since the moment that we are born, <laughs> we have something touching our uh, the back of our head when we are going to bed. Could it be a pillow, could it be the arm of a, a mother, a father. When uh, it is, there is something there, and uh, so. In space, the the, 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 the the head tended to, or tends to, to float and float forward. So this uh, could, for some astronauts, it was very helpful to have this type of countermeasure. Uh, this is another very important area, which is nutrition, that can not just be a kind of countermeasures to the for the social and the, the well-being in general terms of the astronaut, but it is also very important for the uh, how the, the let's say the the calorie intake or the calcium or protein intake is uh, happening during the mission. Uh, in the past, you now and I put here a kind of try to put here a kind of evolution of we had like a toothpaste you no know, food, <laughs> but nowadays we can have a proper um, Fresh fruit, fresh fruits or vegetables. We can have uh, a, a proper, let's say, menu uh, that can be even discussed previously with the astronauts during the the mission or before the mission. Sorry, but um, this is also very important as uh, a countermeasure. You know, remember that food is not just for our entertainment or. Uh, uh, or how well we feel when we are eating, but also uh, provide us with lots of ingredients uh, that are very important. I brought this uh, picture here because something that concerns me a lot is that uh, uh, astronauts, they, of course, they go to the toilet uh, every day. You know, they have to, uh, to eliminate their feces or they urine many times a day and so on, but they have no way to shower. And this is something that for me <laughs> is, uh, is something that calls the attention because we are talking to go to Mars and we don't have a proper shower in microgravity. Uh, this is uh, something that can affect, uh, for example, um, reproduction in space because many women uh, many female astronauts, they, I would say the majority, they use uh, uh, to avoid menstruation, taking uh, daily pills, which is um, uh, maybe part of that is explained by the fact that the hygiene is very poor. No, you, you, they, they have these um, towels with um, liquid that are, uh, that kills uh, bacteria and so on, but and it has a good odor and uh, you know, it, th there are ways, let's say, for the astronauts to have their hygiene uh, done every day, but it is not a shower, it's not something that uh, maybe becomes needed. 
uh, one area that uh, space medicine will have to <laughs> to work very hard to understand and to really contribute and and make uh, let's say and help help the uh, space agencies or or the private sector uh, to have it as a, as a safe flight is uh, space tourism. Uh, it's called in many different ways, but in any any case, it's someone that does not is not from the core of astronauts. So when I say that, I'm not saying that I'm saying that these people are not as selected or as trained as uh, astronauts. Uh, normally, astronauts are very healthy. They are men and women about mid forties nowadays. Uh, they are um, psychologically selected and so on and so forth. You know, trained and so on. Uh, as we get to to uh, space tourism, we are gonna have candidates that are less fit, might be sick and take medication. And uh, could be, let's say, much older. Uh, we just have had the Cap Captain Kirk <laughs> uh, going to space. Uh, even if it was a brief, uh, you know, a very short flight, it was five minutes. But in, in any case, he was uh, in microgravity. So we are going to need lots of help to understand because you need to imagine that from Gagarin in 1961 till now, everything that we know about space physiology and medicine is based on uh, basically health individuals, men and women, more men <laughs> than women. Uh, There's another area that's very controversial because uh, we, we have lots of information, let's say, about how men, uh, how male astronauts behave in space, could be mentally, could be uh, physically, you know, physiologically. Uh, and uh, we have a very uh, small percentage of female astronauts. So in any case, uh, we do not have uh, people that are sick going into space. Ah, I decided to go into space and I have diabetes, for example, or hypertension. And uh, so we are going to need lots of uh, uh, inputs from uh, research here on the ground, research in, um, in missions, and also our friends here, artificial intelligence, trying to help us identify uh, a disease and help to manage the first, let's say, um, uh, issues no, that uh, an, an astronaut or a space tourist will have. We need to remember that, uh, uh, I'm just going back there, sorry. Uh, we need to remember that for uh, missions uh, in orbit or even on the moon, the distance is quite in favor of telehealth. Uh, even if you don't get, let's say, real uh, time, uh, communication, you are going to get a delay of one to two seconds, which means that even in a medical emergency, it will be uh, okay. If you go further, you know, of course, to Mars, uh, this um, the distance between the planets can vary from about 55 to 400 million kilometers, which can give a delay in the communication of uh, three minutes each way when they are close, and uh, 24, 22, 24 minutes each way when they are um, far apart. So this is something that is um, uh, very important to understand because in this type of missions, especially for emergencies or incidents, accidents, we will need uh, robots, artificial intelligence, very smart systems that can uh, take over until maybe uh, we have a um, communication with doctors uh, here on Earth. So one area that uh, uh, when I was introduced, uh, uh, was mentioned that I, I like to dedicate myself is uh, digital technology applies to human health uh, 
in remote areas on Earth and, uh, and including also space, uh, like virtual reality, augmented reality, um, AI, and uh, so on. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we can use all these, let's say, uh, new techniques to help with uh, training, immersive exercise training, for example, for uh, tourists or astronauts, people that will be in exposed to microgravity, uh, or even the hypogravity of the moon one day, uh, we can help uh, people to understand the change in the body so we can simulate some of the change that happen during a space mission in our physiology. Uh, we can have uh, uh, computer-assisted medical diagnosis and surgery uh, systems helping doctors to uh, provide health care for astronauts in space. So this is a, a combination of uh, many different areas. You take the health area, which is, and believe me, not just medicine, uh, it includes pharma, psychology, nutrition, and so on, plus um, the technical areas, which will be engineering, uh, computer sciences, and uh, biomedical informatics, and so on. So we, we need to work inter and multidisciplinary. Otherwise, we are not going to go anywhere. We are going to stay where we are. Uh, just as an example, um, uh, surgery in microgravity. This was a parabolic flight study uh, conducted by Campbell and his team. And you can see that uh, uh, augmented reality could help define some techniques or define some uh, uh, methods of uh, um, uh, surgical procedures, and uh, I think that that's that's really very important. And more recently, you know, uh, the international at uh, the International Space Station, we had um, <laughs> the hologram of a doctor, and uh, it was uh, it was interesting because the psychological impact of having a doctor there, although the doctor was not there, <laughs> uh, was very very impressive for the astronauts. Uh, of course, this can be uh, improved. For example, if you have, uh, um, let's say, space tourists, you know, we can have your own doctor, let's say, uh, talking here on, on, the, on, on the ground, but with the hologram, with the, their, uh, pre his, pre his or her presence in, um, in space. And I think that, that it could be uh, again, very important psychologically. Exercise in space is now taking a, another aspect. Now, if you consider uh, that uh, we can have, a, let's say, a mix of entertainment in space missions and uh, space tourism, and maybe one day we can come up with a space Olympics. No, it's uh, something that uh, um, astronauts have. Uh, uh, do uh, they 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 do some um, let's say uh, activities, maybe a bit more like an entertainment than a proper competition. But this is something that it's important to see that is expanding from uh, hotels or 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 trips, uh, quick trips to space to a completely different scenario you know, that could be involving competition of different teams. Okay, so this is uh, what I would like to uh, present to you. I'm uh, open to questions and comments. I hope you have enjoyed and it was not very boring and nobody's sleeping now. <laughs> no, 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 nobody is sleeping and... Uh... I thank you so much for this interesting lecture. Um, I have a question indeed uh, before I start. Um, is there a difference between men and women? Um, because uh, in discussion is um, that there should be a, um, a all female mass mission uh, because women are smaller. Uh, also in the uh, average and uh, the males and uh, they um, 
use less oxygen, consume less consumables, um, produce less carbon dioxide, dioxide, and they have lower mass uh, and take up less volume. So this was the argument for an all female crew um, and uh, because it would um, require considerably less support and uh, allow a smaller spacecraft. But um, the other question is, also, um, if so, um, but from the psychological point of view, I think it is good to have a mixture between men and women. But um, is there an impact um, from microgravity? Also, is there a difference uh, from the impact to women and men? Yeah, as we know, <laughs> No, men and women here on Earth have lots of uh, anatomical and physiological difference and also the expression of clinical diseases. Uh, there are some diseases that are more, let's say, pronounced in women, like, for example, autoimmune diseases. So um, it is. I don't think that we should uh, select a, a crew you know, to go to Mars or to live on the moon uh, based on... You know, it's, specific concepts we we need to be uh I, I believe that we need to have men and women uh for this type of trip different than it uh, as i was mentioned for space tourism for this type of trip i think that they should be very healthy initially they should be very well trained and uh, as i also mentioned digital technology can help with several aspects i am uh, conducting now a um, I'm, uh, one of my jobs is I am a professor at uh, the School of, Me uh, of Medicine of the University of Lisbon. And uh, we, uh, me and two other colleagues, Professor Faust and Professor Edson, we established a center of research. And uh, we, what we are, one of our research that is involving undergrad and grad students is exactly related to the effects of hypogravity, not microgravity, hypogravity, with and without virtual reality. So it is, uh, that's what I'm saying, you know, that's the, the, it is important to understand uh, and um, the reactions and see which type of profile would be the best one. I don't think that it is, um, is something simple. <laughs> Yeah, um, I also would like to welcome Bernard Foing. Hello, <laughs> Professor uh, yeah. Foing is, is yes. our president, and uh, I I think you know each other. You know yes. each other, yeah. Yeah, excellent. So thank, uh, thank you very much for very interesting uh, uh, research. Uh, and actually, uh, so from Space Renaissance, uh, now uh, I've been involved in a number of experiments that we put on board International Space Station, and also some robotic experiment uh, that we we are preparing for the moon and my question is uh, how do you see for long duration uh, so one six gravity uh, uh, stay on uh, the moon uh, so is it closer to condition in zero g so from the human physiology point of view uh, uh, you know uh, bone dem demineralization also immuno um, uh, defense, uh, or, or how much is uh, still um, similar to what we have on Earth, because still we have a, a gravity. So for long duration, stay on the moon, like I would like to do, I plan to retire on the moon. So if I stay one year, so um, uh, how should I prepare uh, myself and how can we then really um, consider normal activities on the surface of the moon for long periods yeah well whatever i say is a bit of a speculation no? because you don't have the data <laughs> but <laughs> and i love data but uh, it is uh, as you mentioned uh, very correctly that there is still gravity on the moon so the effects should be a bit less pronounced than in microgravity but it's still we still have i believe that we still have the same uh, let's say direction of change, although maybe less pronounced. Uh, the what we uh, uh, can use as um, uh, countermeasure 
is uh, what we have in space, which is uh, maybe a lunar acad academy, a, a lunar gym <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to exercise and uh, to try to keep bone muscles and the cardiopulmonary system um, uh, you know, active. And, uh, but uh, we were discussing in the beginning, I don't know if you were connected, uh, the possibility of um, uh, having, uh, how do I say, um, Artificial gravity. Art artificial gravity, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. this is but, uh, a very yeah. complex. Uh, I, I'm not an engineer, so yeah. when I talk about artificial gravity as an engineer, they go, oh, it's so difficult, so complex. Yeah. It's so... But uh, yes, artificial gravity, that's one way, but uh, staying for long duration, period, and infrastructure on the moon, in case we will not have artificial gravity. So uh, I was wondering for a sustainable uh, community, in particular, I think that within uh, uh, 20 years, we will have uh, 100 people on the moon, the first baby born on the moon. So how do you think it would affect the growth? Like children, the fact that uh, you live in partial gravity, so that would be a very different environment that uh, uh, yeah. just survival. Yeah, it's not just the gravity no, that is going to be different. Uh, the habitats would have to recreate somehow the atmosphere of Earth yeah, this we do. Yes, we will do. We will create yeah. that atmosphere. Protect, yes. protect against the radiation and the moon dust. But as I said, I think that there is. Um, uh, we stayed in microgravity for 438 days uh, with Valery Polyakov continuously, and he returned yeah. and he was healthy. So we, sh we should assume that. Um, in a protected environment, we can stay on the moon for the same period of time yeah. and uh, using the same countermeasures. I mentioned diet, I mentioned uh, exercise, I mentioned uh, things related to the, the entertainment and socialization you know, that is very important for the isolation and confinement. But in any case, uh, I don't uh, I don't think that we, we have a final answer, but it, Based on what we know uh, in relation to microgravity affecting the body, I think that it is possible. We have this limit, 438 days. Maybe if we stay two years, three years, it's going to be a different scenario. Mm. Uh, and But I am sure as well that the, the permanence on the moon will be increased gradually. I don't think that, mm -hmm. they, uh, that the space agencies will... Uh, send someone to spend like two years on the moon. Yeah, uh, but I think that uh, the model of six months, like we do on International Space Station, yeah, six space station it's very, yeah. very possible. So it's feasible. And then we could have it just also always keeping once it's gravity, which I think it allows also to, I mean, uh, for instance, I would like to organize Olympic Games on the moon mm -hmm. uh, in 20 years. So no cheating, one six G and for everybody. And we can fly on the moon. We can uh, jump, and uh, so I see that we uh, we can adapt to this different environment without reproducing uh, exactly what we have on Earth. If there is not a medical, uh, okay, yeah. bottleneck, huh? so we are, we have to see. But six months in order within ten years for some of the uh, precursor astronauts in order to have a permanent presence on the moon, it seems that that's something which is uh, feasible. Yeah. And uh, we still have to accompany that also. Uh, we will no, not be I, alone. I, I agree with that. I just think that we need to motivate more um, uh, space research on the ground yeah. related to the moon because everything that we uh, usually do uh, is microgravity simulation. So yeah. to have a hypogravity uh, simulation, as I am, I mentioned my studies. Yes, hypogravity. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, this is something that is a turning point because we are going to learn something with uh, uh, we are going to accumulate some knowledge in relation to what is um, the walking pattern, how you, um, uh, I don't know, your cardiovascular system function in an, an environment that it is not microgravity, but it is uh, yeah. very low in terms of gravity when compared to Earth. So uh, I think that it's we need to be, just be careful when we uh, speculate. You know, it is uh, important yeah. to motivate the right direction of research and 
um, and the, the gathering of knowledge, I believe. Mm. Also in the robotic phase or in the Artemis phase, you know, there will be humans uh, six days only per year, but uh, they could deploy some biology experiment with, uh, you know, plants, with uh, other animals where we could learn also for longer duration. Oh, of course, yeah. How to adapt there. Yeah. No, for sure, you are right, yeah. And so I want to uh, yeah, advertise that, that uh, uh, my last point, we okay. have an opportunity to launch some payload to the moon maybe 2028, 2029, with a, a lunar lander company called Cosmosis. And we are looking for experiment where we could test uh, biology or others. So any ideas you would have uh, there? Okay, yeah. let's keep it right. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I, have short, I have a short question, Adriano, before you start. Uh, from the chat, from, a question from the chat. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a few questions, but... Uh... Uh, first of all, an answer, because uh, uh, Professor Rosomano made a question at the beginning of uh, her uh, lecture. She said, uh, do we want to become a sapiens space, uh, spa spa spatial uh, sapiens, or we want to remain a sapiens sapiens, or only living in space, but without changing? Well, I think that, of course, we will change. It is, it is impossible that uh, going to live in space, whatever the condition we are able to simulate, uh, we will remain as we are on Earth. Uh, the important thing from our humanist point of view is the time of this process. If we go there and start to live in reduced gravity on the moon or in zero microgravity in, in, in orbit and so on, there will be, I think, uh, two quick changes and uh, maybe unpredictable, uh, no, also predictable effects on the on the health and on the reproduction capability and all these kind of things. This considering uh, both the microgravity and the radiations that are uh, com combined the action of space on Earth. So I believe that. Uh, the longer the the process, the longer the change, the the, be the best for uh, for for humanity, and that's why I think that uh, uh, working on the moon and living in in uh, on Ail Lagrange rotating habitats would be the best. So making shifts shifts of 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 uh, work of uh, job. Maybe uh, two weeks uh, per shift, or what uh, can be uh, configured, and and then go back to 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 sleep in a rotating habitat, to to live in a rotating habitat, making two weeks on the on the moon and two weeks on on, a, on the rotating habitat. I think that would be the best for the, for the moon and for Mars also, because also on Mars we have this problem. And uh, let me say the moon is very important because it's uh, now the, the, the beginning of the space economy, let me say, the real space economy. Uh, but Mars will be very much important in, the, in maybe in one century or, or some decades uh, as a logistic pole between the internal solar system and the external solar system toward the asteroid belt and the Jupiter moons and so on. So, uh, I believe a, a, a kind of a humanist strategy should be designed and defined in order to to manage the, the space settlement in a humanist way that take care of humans that are, are humans are our our main goal no so yeah we no, no, I agree I agree I think that it's um something that you have to do step by step and uh, and learn through the process and uh, speculate less and get more data. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, there's a question. Lecture. I'm very happy. Yes, I have a question I from the. a lot of things, I think. <laughs> you can't hear I, me. I, as I said in the beginning, I didn't want to do something very uh, medical in the sense that I would scare the audience because I know that the majority are not doctors. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, be interesting enough to see all the aspects that are important and how can yes, yes. motivate the discussion. I think uh, not, yeah, can... we are, our audience is not scared by that. And uh, if you read the book by Scott Kelly, 
you, you should. I, I read it. I read. Yeah, because uh, when when he came back to Earth. So it, yeah, the other important thing. Sorry that I didn't say. Uh, wait a moment. Can you but hear I, me? No, no. But I, I just two words. Two words to complete my. Uh, Can you hear me or not? Uh, okay. The, the, uh, the, it's not only the health. There is also another important reason that is freedom. I mean. If I decide to migrate, let's uh, think about Bernard. He wants to uh, to relocate on the moon for his uh, retirement. But let's think that in two, in 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 a, in, a, in a couple of years, he say, mm, no, it was not a good decision. I want to go back to Earth. <laughs> uh, if if he if he lived for two years in microgravity, coming back to Earth would be very painful, and maybe a rehabilitation if it is enough. But it could be also, that. yeah. Yeah. So there, there is. Yeah. Maybe for my hundredth birthday, maybe I come back uh, to Earth to celebrate, <laughs> <laughs> and then after we go to Mars. <laughs> I, I I I will prepare you a cake. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I have a, taking so much time. Uh, I, I have one question from the chat. Uh, and zwar, um, Boris Petrovich from Serbia is asking, what kind of devices do you use for? Uh, PR uh, simulation and your research? Uh, it is commercial um, devices. Uh, we don't, uh, let's say, develop something that it is uh, like to reinvent the wheel, you know, and we wouldn't do that in, with the same um, uh, techniques or so. Uh, even, for example, for the simulation of hypogravity, we are using a, um, a treadmill called Outer G that can decrease uh, in inverted commas, no? Your uh, body weight uh, simulating how you walk or run on Mars or on the moon. And, um, but for example, uh, if I have, a, let's say a group of um, computer scientists or um, you know, people that uh, work with um, uh, virtual reality and so on, we can try to customize the protocols and the use of the virtual reality. So it will be a, a very good option. So that's a very good question. It is uh, important for the design of the experiment. Thank you. Uh, I thank you so much for this interesting lecture, uh, for the nice conversation. Uh, between Verna <laughs> and you and uh, Adriano. And um, I hope you will come back again uh, in one year or two years. And I also would like to invite you uh, to join SRI if you are not uh, already a member. I am and... a member. I am a member. <laughs> yeah. Yes. She's and, a proud uh, member. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent, yes. And uh, I would like to invite you to follow our um, ongoing uh, webinar series uh, on the 17th of uh, June. We will have Kaya Antley and uh, Tiasa Savoric uh, talking about art themed virtual reality for mitigating or mitigating uh, isolation on long duration space missions. So uh, I think it would be an interesting topic for you yes. at the same time and two weeks. Um, and yeah, you are invited to join us and also our audience is invited to join us. And um, thank you, Adriano yeah. and Bernard. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to make for a, a little... this lecture. I would like to make a comment because it was very inspiring. And now I'd like to see, oh, can we follow up that with some uh, research collaboration? Like, for instance, uh, Space Renaissance, we have a space habitat uh, committee. Uh, we have also, uh, we are running some analog astronaut campaign. I just wanted to inform you that last week, we had two analog astronauts spending one week on the moon, uh, completely uh, isolated on the moon base that we have in Poland. And it was a woman. No, and a man. No, yeah, very, very similar to what we we'll do with Artemis 3. And so they just uh, uh, came back, but we would be interested to see uh, some experiment we could conduct in this analog base where we, we use also virtual reality uh, there 
and we could simulate some of the uh, experience uh, in preparation for Artemis or International Lunar Research Station. We have also a base in Hawaii called ISIS that, uh, where we are conducting uh, some long duration uh, isolation, also one week or two weeks isolation. And more recently, we have developed a modular uh, moon base that can travel from place to place. So we had it in Italy uh, with Space Renaissance, we had it in France, uh, it's, uh, we had it in Holland, and we plan to use it uh, also for uh, research and outreach. And uh, we plan in September to bring it to the facility at the European Astronaut Center, LUNA, which will be a big facility built by the European Space Agency and the German Aerospace Center, where they are going also to test some partial gravity device for astronauts, for uh, experiments. So it would be good to think of some experiment we could conduct using this analog uh, uh, base facility, also the big ESA DLR facility at Luna. So uh, we have and to talk to you, Professor I'll Thaisa. think about and let's keep in yeah. touch, of course. Excellent. Okay, this is really nice to, yeah. to see that uh, some collaboration will start, so I, I love this. Um, yeah, I wish you all a nice week and uh, thank you again uh, for your lecture and I hope uh, we will collaborate um, and I wish you all a nice week, a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very bye. much, Serena. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.